Hi, this is Larry Parman again with the estate planning law firm of Parman and Easterday. Today I want to visit with you for a few minutes about some of the management issues that come up in the context of creating an estate plan. Now you might think, well, what management issues might that be? And specifically what I'm talking about is who handles your affairs when you're no longer able? You've either become incapacitated or someone's asked to take over and perform the duties similar to that of an executor upon your death. So let's start at the very beginning and just cover a few basics. First of all, all trusts that are created have three parties. We have the trustors, and sometimes those are referred to as the settlers or the grantors. And these are the people that own the property, and they create the plan. They own and create. The trustees manage the assets in the trust. And of course, the beneficiaries, they get to spend the money. That all makes pretty good sense up to this point. Now, that's what happens in the case of planning through a trust and a revocable living trust, or it could even be an irrevocable trust. Every trust that's been created has those three parties. Now, in the context of management issues, we can also have those occur during a last will and testament. And typically, that revolves around who's named as the executor. Most states now refer to them as the personal representative. So I want to focus a little bit today on this decision because this is a challenge for some people. Years ago when I started my practice, I used to believe that if we could sit down with the family, talk about distributing property to the children, and if possible, perhaps even have a child or children in some order of succession be named as the successor trustee. That's the person who has the responsibility for finding the assets, gathering them all up, getting them appraised, paying taxes if, if need be, the final expenses, filing the final tax returns, and then distributing the estate. The same factors would be included in a last will and testament. I'm going to focus a little bit today, though, in just discussing the role of the successor trustee and some of the challenges people have in making that decision. As I said, I used to like to kind of keep that in the family. But what I've found is this. When you select someone to manage your estate, either during a period of incapacity or at the time of death, that's really a business decision and not a love decision. Too often I've seen people make that decision based on who the oldest child is, thinking that some child, the oldest, might be offended if they're not selected. When in reality, that choice should be based on who's most qualified and able to take care of those responsibilities because believe me, it's a job. And again, the other factor that's sometimes looked at in addition to the age is the proximity. Who's closest to the parents? So if you have three children, two live out of town, one lives in town, sometimes they'll select the person who's closest to them, who lives next door or down the road. What I'm going to submit to you is that age and proximity, while a factor, should not be conclusive in your selection of who's going to manage your estate, either upon incapacity or at the time of death. Now, there's another factor here as well, and that's skill or preparedness. And you have issues dealing with money and who's best able to handle the money and make financial decisions. And that might suggest one set of successors or managers. But on the other hand, when we're dealing with health care issues, you might want someone completely different to take care of those responsibilities. So let me give you a quick example. If, you're, if you have someone, uh, a child, who is a CPA, well, they might be eminently qualified to handle the financial matters. But on the other hand, if you have a daughter who's a registered nurse, she might be the most appropriate person to take care of the health care decisions and make those for you, even though she may live 200 miles away. So again, the skill factors weigh into the selection of who your manager will be, either for financial purposes or for health purposes. Now, there's another option here, too, and that is to look outside your family. Now, I've really changed my opinion on this over the years, and I believe that there is a growing role, an increased role, and responsibility for an independent trustee. 
And by an independent trustee, I mean either a bank or a trust department or a trust company, or perhaps even a trusted advisor. Again, it might be a CPA, or it might be a close family friend, or it might be an uncle or brother, someone that understands you and understands your financial situation perfectly and knows exactly how to follow the instructions that you put in your trust and ensures that that distribution will be made according to your preferences and desires. The other thing that I say about independent trustees is contrary to what you might be thinking about in terms of making this selection. Some people will say to me, well gosh, my children get along beautifully, so I'll just name them. And can't I name all three of them together? Well think about this, if you name all three of them together and give them equal power, what happens if one goes this direction, one goes this direction, and one goes this direction? Then you have all kinds of chaos. If on the other hand you name three and require all three of them to approve any action, then it's easy to see that you can have a log jam, a roadblock, you can have total inactivity uh, on, on things that need to be done right now, particularly on the healthcare side. So I prefer in naming trustees or managers of your estate plan to have an order, a chain of command if you will. Name them in order, give one person that, op that responsibility, and then and task them to fulfill it, but have backups in place. And then back to the independent trustee when people say, well gosh, all my children get along beautifully, let's just name them together or in some order. My answer is if they get along beautifully, why would you inject this responsibility into that formula in a way that could cause chaos and havoc and could completely destroy that relationship? If they get along beautifully now, you might think seriously about selecting that independent trustee because as I kid people about at the time of this discussion, it's really no kidding matter. At that point then the children can all work together because they have a common enemy, that independent trustee. But however, remember that independent trustee is working for you. That independent trustee has a fiduciary duty to your children. and to your other beneficiaries, to operate with the utmost care, the utmost and heightened sense of responsibility, to carry out the instructions you carefully put in that trust instrument, or perhaps even in your last will and testament. So this, these are just a few of the issues that come up in our discussions with clients about selecting a manager for their estate, either during a period of incapacity or at the time of death. I hope you enjoyed this quick overview. And in conclusion, just remember, this is an important task. This is an important choice. You have a lot of different options. Age and proximity and skill are factors but shouldn't be conclusive. They should be balanced against the relationship your children have and what you want to see achieved on that side as well. So until further uh, visiting, this is Larry Parman with the firm of Parman and Easter Day. We'll talk again soon.